Welcome to episode 77 of the MMA Rundown Podcast. We have a couple title fights that just got finished up. So we got Israel Adesanya going up against Paulo Costa. Adesanya won that fight and won it in dominant fashion, so I'll recap that, as well as a few other things that were related to the fight. Uh, a couple things he said after the fight, as well as something a lot of people are talking about with his right peck looking a little bit off and asymmetrical to his left peck. Uh, so just as far as what I've gathered on that and what I think is the case there. Then we have the co event, which is another title fight between Jan Blahovic and Dominic Reyes. Uh, Blahovic was able to find his spots on Dominic Reyes. Reyes was fairly picky about when and he wanted to engage, uh, surprisingly so, especially after what we saw early in the John Jones fight and that ended up working against him. And Blahovic was able to get the win by knockout and claim the UFC light heavyweight championship. Then I'll recap the rest of the UFC 253 card. Preview the card coming up next week, which is UFC two or UFC um, Fight Night Home versus Aldana. We've got a couple stories related to Colby Covington, so one of them is just the MMA media going out of their way on Fight Week trying to get Colby in trouble. Uh, the term often used is cancel. I'm not exactly sure what they were hoping to get out of Colby, whether it was going to be him getting fined, uh, him getting suspended, or I don't know what, what they were going for, but they were definitely trying to go after Colby and get him in trouble. So I'll talk about that whole story. Talk about a conversation that came up pretty soon after I recorded the last podcast, which is just ridiculous. Now, to be fair, a lot of the people who were saying ridiculous things were people who are not MMA fans. They were basketball fans. Uh, but still, there was a lot of people talking about what would happen if Colby Covington fought LeBron James and how that would go. And I think a lot of people... Um, have no idea what they're talking about. I'll just say that much if they think that it would be competitive or that LeBron would win. Uh, so I'll talk about that. Uh, from there, a couple of jujitsu topics. We have who's number one, uh, that really big event that Flow Grappling is putting on, uh, where they've got a, a, a bunch of really good matches. One of the more notable ones is going to be that wrestler versus jujitsu guy match uh, with Nicky Ryan versus Tony Ramos. And also, in terms of jujitsu, there is Sean O'Malley competing in a Brazilian jujitsu tournament. Um, so I'll talk about how he did in that tournament and also some of the reaction to it and whether or not I feel that's fair. And the last thing to talk about and I was debating whether or not to include it because it, it just feels like with Connor, every time he starts bringing stuff up, it's it's just a smoke screen and it's really going nowhere. Uh, so I'll make it my last topic and I'm probably not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it, but I will talk about Connor McGregor mentioning the Diego Sanchez fight and then also how he's saying that now he wants to fight Manny Pacquiao and Pacquiao saying that he also intends to fight Connor. So... I'll touch on that. If that's a story that actually does gain some legs, then maybe I'll go deeper into it, but I'll, I'll just briefly cover it at the end. So back to the top, we have Israel Adesanya versus Paulo Costa. Uh, very surprising how the fight went, given that after Costa's last fight, which was against Joel Romero, we saw him going up against a very dangerous opponent, a very powerful opponent, and just walking him down as if he didn't really care, wasn't scared of the power. Even after getting dropped, he still kept moving forward. So the idea was, okay, well, he's fight fighting Adesanya. Adesanya is incredibly effective when he's able to utilize his feints. Uh, and get people waiting on him but if you're just constantly marching forward yes you might take some shots early but are you able to land some shots early as well and being and, and able to really change the complexion of the fight and Costa never really went after Adesanya he he kind of took the middle a little bit it's not as though he was getting backed up against the fence really but he wasn't ever really pushing Adesanya to the fence either he was sort of waiting waiting for his openings and trying to play a technical striking match against Adesanya which is probably one of the worst ways to fight is for Adesanya and as a result the fight went very poorly for him uh, so over and over he was taking outside leg kicks there were some cupping marks on the back of both of his calves. It's hard to say whether or not he had an issue with one of the calves and he just cupped them both so you couldn't really tell what the issue was. Um, sometimes people do cupping regardless whether or not there's a, a serious injury or not, uh, just because they feel that's a good way to to kind of get their body prepared. Not sure if that really had any impact or not, but with that being said, Adesanya was able to land a ton of leg kicks to that front leg. Uh, it was just completely bruised up and battered. It, limited the mobility of Costas, and it's not as though Costa was really all that mobile to begin with in this fight, given how he was fighting, uh, but that made things tougher for him, and then from there, Adesanya was able to find some more openings, um, was finding openings for head kicks. First round, definitely won that. Second round, uh, he, he was just hitting up even more, and then after landing a head kick, had Costa hurt. Costa got a little bit more aggressive, uh, but still wasn't fighting the way you would have expected him to fight. Adesanya was able to Get in, on, get in on the pocket when Costa's trying to throw what was like a jab and hook combo with the same hand. So he was throwing lead hand jab um, with his left hand and then was trying to go left hook right off of that. Uh, and on the jab, Adesanya was able to slip on the inside of the jab. And then as the left hook was coming, uh, Adesanya was able to block that and also throw a left hook of his own. Landed right behind the ear. I don't think Costa ever saw it coming. Uh, it was a hard punch anyway, but the fact that he didn't see it made it all that more effective. Plus getting hit behind the ear is also a very effective spot to hit someone. So Costa goes down, uh, doesn't exactly know where he is. Adesanya finishes him on the ground and secures the win there and is able to defend the title. At that point, 
outside of the fight itself, there's sort of some separate stuff that's going on. So first off, Adesanya decides that he wants to dry hump Paulo Costa while Costa's still down and turtled up. Not really a big fan of that move. Um, from there, it was just sort of like this weird... And and I guess I, I get it for, for Israel Adesanya. He's, he's a big fan of memes and the internet. And sort of what he it seemed like he was doing is he was just like throwing together a bunch of random phrases that... I guess on their own, if you can sort of clip it as it's one thing, it's kind of like, oh, that's kind of funny, and that could make a good gif, or that could make a good meme. It just sort of kind of felt weird how he kind of mixed it all together, but starts off, walks away, and then says um, something about, like, wrap my dick around my waist, it's a black belt, which is, <laughs> if it's not something you're expecting, it'll kind of make you laugh at first, but it's still kind of a weird thing to say. Uh, from there, there was another exchange that was caught, and we didn't get to catch the full exchange, so I'm not exactly sure what happened, but he was in uh, in uh, Paulo Costa's corner. I'm not sure if he went over there and was going to respectfully say, hey, g- good job, like, congrats, or uh, I-, I don't know what he was planning on saying to them, but whatever the case may be, once the clip started playing, it was Eric Oliver seeing, saying that we're coming for you, uh, we're coming for Volkanovski next, uh, to which Adesanya responded, I'll come all over you, which, at least in that case, it, it kind of made sense that uh, that uh, Eric Oliver seen used the word come, and then and then Adesanya just responded with the word come as well. So I guess in that case, it seems a little less pre-planned uh, than some of the other stuff that he was saying, like the black belt line. But even still, that was kind of a weird move that he just won a fight and is like making gestures that he's going to come all over his opponent's coach. I'm a little... If if what I saw was the entirety of of it, and it was just like he went over and then Albert Sainz talking shit like, oh, well, you might have won, but your, your buddy Volkanovski is fucked now. Like... If that was the context of it, I'm not really that upset about, upset by it. But if he was like going over there, um, starting shit, and then in response to something that Adesanya said, Alvaro Sin made the comment about Volkanovski, and then Adesanya then responded with the "come all over you" thing. That's that's, that's not great. And again, it, it's fighting. It's not like there should be any kind of penalty for Adesanya. I mean, it is what it is. If you if you find the stuff funny, then you're gonna like him more. If you think it's over the line, you might like him a little bit less. It, it is what it is. I don't think there's any reason to penalize him. And this isn't like that fight earlier on the card where you had a guy, uh, Hakeem Duadu, who is telling his opponent to stop fucking running, and then the the ref's like, "Hey, hey, no profanity." That was that was really stupid. And I'll get back. I'll, I'll get I'll get to that. But it, it still was kind of odd how Adesanya was handling the, the victory. And it's one of those things where it's like, I I, I don't know if, if in glory he had a, a couple losses where opponents do that to him, and he felt like you know what, if people feel like it's okay to do that to me, then I'm going to do it to other people. It's not like this is something that Adesanya does to everyone. Uh, it seems like it's just the people that he talks trash with. But with that being said, Adesanya knows that trash talk is part of selling a fight. And it's part of building up a fight. So to like hold that against someone, and when they're in, in a really down moment like Costa is right there, where he's worked for a long time to get to this point where he can fight for a title, he doesn't really perform up to his standards. He loses, and he has to like feel you dry humping his back, then see you like gesturing towards his coach that you're going to come on your come, that he's going to come on his co- come on your coach. It's just it, it's not a great way to handle it, but. With that being said, do I think the UFC should punish him for it? Absolutely not. I just think it's kind of odd. I think there are going to be people who are going to watch that. They're going to find it to be hilarious, and they're going to like him even more. There are going to be some people who might like it a little less, and you sort of get that that, that sort of thing that happened with Conor McGregor at times and also happened with Anderson Silva where people just looked at them as like really cocky and they wanted to see them lose. So maybe now uh, if he fights Cannonier next, assuming that Cannonier gets by Robert Whitaker, then maybe people are going to want to watch that fight again. Um, but rather than just to watch Adesanya win, maybe they want to watch Cannonier win. Because uh, they want to see Adesanya have to take an L, uh, so the UFC they they don't have any need to to penalize him for it. Is it vulgar? Yes, it's a cage fight. That's okay. Like it's not like he actually like pulled his pants down and did anything like to the point where like they're having to blur anything out. Language wasn't necessarily the nicest. It wasn't really good sportsmanship, but I I think he's okay to do it. It was just kind of odd how how that all worked out. Um, the other thing to talk about here was the issue with the right pack. Um, I watched a video online. There was a guy, I think his name's like Brian Sutter or Brian Sutter. Or, um, apparently he's got like some kind of medical background and he was talking about that situation. He was saying that when you have, it, it looks like on its own, it looks like there could be some sort of issue where he might've been taking something exogenous that, that could have led to that. Um, uh, that, that could have had estrogen, estrogen in it. But usually if that's the case, it's not going to be just one side. It would generally be both. Uh, one side like normal, one side didn't. Uh, yes, the, for a pectoral tear, it looks a little bit odd that or a pectoral tear likely would not look that way either. That most most of the time you have a pectoral tear, it's up by the shoulder rather than like in the middle of the pectoral muscle. So it's not entirely clear what the issue was here, but the fact that it was on just one side and not both uh, tends to keep me away from saying that he's he was on some kind of sauce for this fight. 
Um, but it, it definitely was weird, and I hope that we eventually do find out what happened. But with that being said, um, I don't know that Adesanya is going to be willing to give that information out, especially if it is something that could lead to a – or that could be a longer-term issue. Um, but it was kind of odd to see that. Next fight was Dominic Reyes versus Jan Blachowicz. Um Again, expectations of Reyes coming into this fight versus the Reyes that actually performed in this fight were, were two separate things here. A lot of expectation for Reyes to look like he has in some of his past fights where he's on the outside, uh, really quick to counter, uh, really quick to throw the left hand. Uh, when you have guys who are in switch stances, so one guy is orthodox, one guy is southpaw. Southpaw was Reyes, orthodox with Blachowicz. You would expect the, the rear hand to be an effective tool for both of them. And I really expected Dominic Reyes, who's very good at countering with that straight left hand, uh, to be able to find a home on Blahovich and for Blahovich to have trouble uh, initially getting into the pocket and then his hands would start to drop as he throws his second, third, and fourth punches, and that would be a time for Reyes to land. Uh, and we saw that out, out of Blahovich where he was chasing Reyes at times and he was keeping his hands down while he did it and just kind of throwing from, not necessarily from the hip, but he was definitely leading openings um, on his chin. Um, but rather than so, sort of sidestepping, planting his feet, and then throwing a counter, Reyes was just kind of covering up the whole time, covering his head the whole time. Uh, and backing out, and as a result of him doing that over and over, Jan Blachowicz, every time that Reyes would block it to his head, would throw a kick to the body. And that's a pretty big mark right there. Um, so it's just one of those things where it's like a matter of time. Like, is, is Dominic Reyes ever going to try to plant his feet and counter here? Is he just worried that, like, if he tries to plant his feet and counter and he, he times it wrong and he takes a shot that he's going to go out? Like, at some point, if Dominic Reyes wants to win this fight, he's going to have to do something to win this fight. And it really wasn't clear when what he was planning on doing to actually make progress and to actually win some rounds and work towards a finish and ultimately in the second round uh eats a couple heavy shots in a combo gets caught up against the fence at least at that point then he's like okay well i'll at least now start trying to brawl but again that's not necessarily where Reyes is at his best uh, gets clipped with a left hook while they're swinging at each other along the fence uh, gets dropped boy lands a bunch of shots on the ground and then from there um the ref steps in calls a stop to the fight and jan Blachowicz wins the ufc light heavyweight championship at the age of 37 which is kind of crazy to think about it um, Bohovic is a guy who I've seen around for a while. He was never a guy who I thought could ever get to the point where he's fighting for a title, let alone winning a title. Now, granted, John Jones is still in the division. Daniel Cormier is retired. I don't see him beating either of those two. Cormier being retired, okay, that's one thing. Jones leaving the division. That, that's sort of like a, an outside circumstance that definitely gives him an opening there to win the, win the title, and, and he did just that. Do I think that he's the best guy who can make 205 pounds in the UFC right now? No, I think John Jones is better than him. But that's not the question here. It was a question of, is he going to beat Dominic Reyes? Reyes just had a very competitive fight with John Jones. Some people thought he won. Uh, so if you can beat Dominic Reyes, that, that says you're at a pretty comparable level, um, at least through MMA math, and Blahovich was able to do that. So good for him. Uh, as far as what's next for him, he's probably going to be fighting the winner of the Glover Teixeira versus Tiago Santos fight. I would imagine Tiago Santos is going to win that fight, so that puts him in a rematch with a guy who has knocked him out um, in, in his last loss. And if, if that's the fight that we get, um, it'll really be interesting to see what kind of adjustments that Jan Blachowicz makes and if he's able to avoid the same issues that he had before in that prior fight because that fire, prior fight didn't really go all that well for him. So we'll see if this is a, a short reign for Jan Blachowicz, if it's just one of those things where John Jones comes back immediately and he loses his title then or if Tiago Santos earns the title shot and then he loses his title then. Uh, it, it's possible this could be a very short reign for Bilhovich, where it's just one of those things where it's one and done at the top, but even still, it's pretty cool for him to actually make it to the top to win a title. Uh, made a good chunk of money on this on this particular fight. From what it sounds like, it seems like they sold pretty well on pay-per-views. I believe he's getting a good cut of the pay-per-view, so that'll be good for him. Uh, again, as champion, he'll get a cut of the pay-per-view for the next fight. Um, so great opportunity for him. I don't know that I necessarily see him sticking around the top for a while, and that's not just me being like, well, he's 37, he's not going to stick around for a while. I'm just saying, like, fight-wise, it's not like he's going to defend his title, like, two or three times. Uh, and then, like, at the age of, like, 38 and a half or at 39, then he's going to lose it. I, I don't really see him defending it maybe even at all. Uh, if he fights Sean Jones, I don't think he's going to defend the title. If he fights Diago Santos, I think it's going to be a tough one for him, too. So, it just kind of depends on how everything works out. It's also possible with that Santos fight, uh, it's going to be a little bit further down the line. I think it's going to be in October, November. Uh, might actually be November now where it's gotten pushed back to. And then at that point, maybe if they want to force in a light heavyweight title fight for the end of the year or for like January, maybe it makes sense to, to do that. And he fights someone who I haven't even thought of yet. Maybe it's a guy like Hiro Pahatska. Um, but outside of that, it, it seems like it's probably going to be Santos Teixeira. Teixeira I, I guess Teixeira might be a winnable fight for him. Uh, but I don't know that I see Teixeira beating Santos. Uh, but it's probably going to be Santos Teixeira or John Jones for him. But by the way, congratulations to him. Really big win. Uh, odd performance from Dominic Reyes. He's broke his nose. He'll need some time to heal that up. Um, then he'll have to get back in the gym, work his way back. Uh, I'm not sure what will be next for him because I don't really know what timeline he's working on. But it, it seems like with the light heavyweight division, especially if John Jones is out of it, 
Um, th it's not as though it's super duper top heavy, and I'm sure Dominic Reyes can work his way back up and find himself in the title picture again, especially if Jan Blachowicz loses the title and the guy who's holding the title is someone who Dominic Reyes hasn't fought yet. Next topic is going to be the rest of the UFC 253 card. Uh, so the fight before the Reyes and Blachowicz fight was Kai Kara France versus Brandon Royval. Uh, went very well for Kai Kara France at the beginning, had Royval hurt, um, stunned him. Royval then, while he was like trying to step back and sort of recover, um, st started to fall again. At that point, Kai Kara France comes in, tries to tries to go for the finish. Royval lands a spinning back elbow, drops Kai Kara France, and then from there it's just absolute pandemonium between the two of them. Uh, some really good back and forth exchanges. Um, Kai Kara France had gotten on top at one point. Royval was going for a triangle. Uh, Kai Kara France was able to get out of it. Um, goes to Noma Plata. Not super well defended because Royval was able to get a sweep with pretty much just the wrist under control at that point in the Omoplata. Usually you want to control above the elbow at the very least, um, but around the shoulder. Uh, and Royval had lost most of it, but was still able to sweep with it. Uh, landed some good ground and pound from top. Uh, definitely had some good moments, uh, but then they go to the second round. Um, Royval was able to snap Kaikara France's neck down, gets into a guillotine choke. Um, pulls guard off while he has the guillotine and is able to get the finish from there. So really big win for Royval, uh, who's now beaten two straight ranked opponents and may find himself around the top five in the flyweight division, which is kind of crazy. Uh, not just because he's very new to the division and is only two fights in right now, but also because in, in both of those fights, he's had moments that haven't been super duper impressive, uh, but he still found ways to work his way back into the fights and win. I don't know that I see him as a guy who's really a, a title challenger and someone who I could see winning the title, but he, he's definitely a fun fighter to watch. And when you get two wins over two ranked guys in your division, uh, especially a guy like Kai France who's in the top 10, You'll, you'll find yourself in some really big opportunities, so it'll be interesting to see what's next for him. For Kaikawa France, I'm not sure how far they're going to push him down against the... Again, the UFC flyweight division isn't the deepest division, as in they don't have a ton of people in it. Um, so they'll probably get another ranked opponent next, and if he's able to get a win there, then that'll put him in a, in a spot that he's comfortable with, but it, it's going to make things tougher for him if he wants to eventually work his way to a title fight, because now that's another loss for him, um, not long after having a, a loss pretty pretty recently. But before that, we had Ketlin Vieira, um, she was fighting against Ajara Eubanks. Eubanks just... Y y you could tell that she was undersized in this fight. Um, the fight wasn't necessarily the most impressive fight. Vera uh, definitely using the size to her advantage was able to get a couple takedowns at times and was able to grind out some rounds from top. Uh, ultimately wins this fight by unanimous decision, 29-28 on all three judges' scorecards. Uh, it wasn't the most exciting fight to watch, though. fight before that, speaking of not-so-exciting fights, uh, Hakeem Duwadu versus... Zuba Dukakov. I actually kind of thought that Zubaro won this fight. I thought he won the first two rounds. The first round definitely looked like a Zubaro round. The second round was kind of close. Um, third round was definitely Hakeem Duadu, and I guess if you want to penalize Zuba and like take a point away from him and say it was like a 10-8 round for Duadu, which I don't know is necessarily the case, maybe you could have done that, but apparently two of the judges uh, saw that differently. One of the judges gave it 30-27 to Hakeem, so they gave him the first round as well. Um, but both these guys are very tentative, especially early on. Tukagov, because he had the wrestling background, was able to get Dewadu to be a little bit more concerned than he probably should have been about engaging. Uh, and at times, he was able to land some pretty heavy shots, but again, it was mostly like one or two shots at a time. It wasn't like long extended combinations. Um, but he was picking some nice shots here and there, landing some nice shots. Um, but as the fight went on, Hakeem was starting to get a little bit more confident in his takedown defense, especially after he was successfully defending some takedowns and getting up immediately. Uh, and as a result, he was willing to throw a little bit more. And then in the third round, uh, Zuba just wasn't throwing at all, uh, was just backing up the whole time. Hakeem was yelling at him, cursing at him. The ref decided that it was within his purview to tell Hakeem Duadu not to curse, which I thought was ridiculous. This, this is a pay-per-view fight. I'm pretty sure there isn't anywhere in the rules that says you can't curse. Um, but again, it, there's so many different MMA rules that for all I know, he might, the ref might have been on something that none of us were on to. But as, as far as I know... You're, you're allowed to. And I was kind of hoping that after he told um, Hakeem Duwadu not to tell Z Zubair or Tukagov, um, stop backing the fuck up. I, I was kind of hoping that Hakeem would kind of like look back at the ref and say, like, shut the fuck up, and then just like keep fighting. Um, but Duwadu was a little bit more respectful than, than I sort of was in the back of my mind while I was watching that. But again, ultimately, he gets the win here, so that, that's good for him. On uh, the prelims, we had Brad Riddell versus Alex Da Silva. Um, very exciting fight. Da Silva came out really hot, was able to land some nice shots on Riddell, and then was able to take him down. Uh, Riddell was able to work his way back to his feet towards the end of the round. Uh, in the second round, Riddell was a little bit better about staying, or keeping his back off the mat. Uh, was starting to find his shots more often. Uh, again, Brad Riddell is mostly known for his striking. He's a striking coach for City Kickboxing. Um, 
but also was able to land some takedowns as well and get on top of De Silva. And then third round, um, pretty similar as well. So the last two rounds going to Brad Riddell, he wins uh, by un unanimous decision. Uh, fight before that, we had De Diego Sanchez versus Jake Matthews. Uh, Diego Sanchez has been talking a lot about how his coach Josh Fabia is wonderful at keeping him from taking any damage. Look at the Pajara fight. Such a beast, such an explosive guy, yet he hardly damaged Diego Sanchez, um, with legal strikes at least. Uh, that was the storyline going in, but Jake Matthews definitely... <laughs> definitely change that up. I don't think we're going to hear about Diego Sanchez taking no damage um, after training with Fabio after this one. He took a ton of damage in this one. Uh, Matthews was a little bit more patient than I expected him to be. Uh, it seemed like he didn't want to give Sanchez any openings on the feet, so he was sort of just picking his shots there, but whenever he was able to hurt Sanchez, get him to the ground, um, he was laying some ferocious ground and pound and did a lot of damage from there. Uh, but ultimately, he gets the win 30-26 on all three judges' scorecards. There's some talk about Sanchez possibly being pushed into retirement after this, that they just didn't, didn't think he'd look very good. Sanchez definitely didn't look good, but part of the issue is that Diego Sanchez is a 55-pounder uh, who potentially could make 145 if he's really like on top of his diet. I think he actually has made 45 at times, uh, and yet here he is fighting at 170 with a big belly. Uh, so if you're looking at that big belly and you're saying, hey, this tells me that Diego Sanchez isn't mentally into it and I want him to retire because I don't think he's mentally into it, that's one argument. But if your argument is that he can't compete with some of the best fighters in the world, that's a separate argument. I think the issue there more so is that Diego Sanchez isn't in the best shape as a result. He's fighting up a weight class, and it's not really easy to fight up a weight class in the UFC, especially if you aren't, like, at your best athletically, and Diego Sanchez definitely is not at his best athletically right now. Uh, so fighting up a weight class, he's just giving himself issues that don't necessarily need to be there. Uh, so if Diego Sanchez takes some time away, actually, like, gets into really good shape again, um, goes back down to 155. Do I think he's ever going to make a run at the top 15 or a title again? No, but he can definitely still put on some exciting fights and be very competitive with some really good guys. So I don't think that he should be forced to retire, but if this is the kind of effort he's going to put into training where this is how he's going to look and then he's going to just kind of like struggle to make 170, uh, then maybe you could make an argument that he should probably start looking at hanging it up. Um, fight before that, we had Shane Young versus Ludovic Klein. Uh, Klein just landed a really heavy head kick. Uh, had Young occurred, and then was able to finish him up against the fence. Uh, this fight really pissed off Israel Adesanya because apparently Klein missed weight, and then was able to still come in and get the win. And Shane Young only got thirty percent of the purse from Ludovic Klein, and I feel like, and, and, or Adesanya said that he felt like it would be for, fair for it to be more like ninety percent than thirty uh, percent. I don't necessarily know how fair that is. Thirty percent is a, a good amount of money, regardless. I I I don't know that fighters are like, eh, whatever. I'm just giving up thirty percent. Like, who cares? I think most fighters gen genuinely want to make weight, and if they're not making weight, and then you're going to say, okay, we're going to take away 90% of your purse, you could potentially have some issues where you have guys who can't sweat anymore. Um, it's not healthy for them to cut any additional pounds. Like, they've, they've reached their limit, and it's still above the weight limit that they're contracted to fight for. And if they're worried about losing 90% of their, of their pay rather than 30%, there's a chance that those guys might put themselves in the hospital trying to, trying to cut some extra weight that just isn't there to cut. So it's, it, it's hard to say. Um, there was also, and I think it was, actually, I think it was the other way. I, I think la last year or a couple of years ago, the, the guys who were overweight ended up winning most of their fights. So it's not as though those guys tend to lose. So I guess that th there's some reason to be concerned, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know if changing pay is necessarily what's going to fix it. Maybe you can do something where you start giving, taking away points from fighters. Um, maybe take away a point for every pound that's missed by. So if you miss weight by five pounds, then... Even if you're going to win a 30-27 fight, it would actually end up being 27-25 in the other direction and you'd lose. I don't know if that's the answer, um, but I don't know that making a 90% pay cut is necessarily the best idea either. Um, there, th th It just doesn't seem like there's a great way to do it other than to say if you miss weight, you can't fight, uh, which is the case with a lot of like jiu-jitsu tournaments or wrestling tournaments where it's like if you miss weight, you're just out of the bracket. That's it. But if you're going to try to force people to stay back in, I don't know what the best what the best option is there, uh, but that was out of Sinus' case. Uh, then there was a fight between... Alexa Kamer and William Knight, and I was able to win this fight by unanimous decision. Uh, we had Juan Espino versus Jeff Hughes. Espino, um, really nice uh, catch wrestling style, chest compression uh, lock that he was able to, land, able to get on top from side control. Uh, and then the first fight on the card, Danilo Marcus was able to win over Kata Zabragamov. So that covers it for UFC 253. Um, the upcoming fight card will be UFC Fight Night Home versus Aldana. Um, not super excited about this main event, but Aldana, I guess good for her for earning this opportunity for Holly Holm, it seems as though for as long as she wants to keep fighting, she's going to be in these main event type of opportunities. Uh, she has a big name. She has a good pedigree. Uh, hasn't necessarily looked all that great at times. You would figure that 
this fight's probably going to take place on the feet for the most part, and if it does, that should favor Holly Holm. With that being said, Holly Holm, it seems like over time, is starting to get a little bit more gun-shy on the feet, especially in that Amanda Nunes fight. It was surprising how uncomfortable she was with throwing punches, uh, that she was just trying to stay away, um, stay, with, stay in kicking range the main, for most of the time. And even with that being said, still took a head kick and ended up getting outstruck by Amanda Nunes as a result because she was so uncomfortable and engaging. If Holly Holm plays super defensive here, more so than even like the traditional Holly Holm that we're used to seeing, the, the counter-puncher Holly Holm, uh, but she gets to the point where she's like almost unwilling to throw punches because uh, she's worried about Aldana's power. That could be a real issue for her. Uh, but with that being said, it, it's just hard for me to pick this fight. I think Holm should have the edge here because I think this fight's going to take place on the feet for the most part. Uh, but what I've seen from Holm recently does worry me a little bit. Coming event, uh, not the strongest coming event, but this is what we got. We got Carlos Felipe versus Jorgen DeCastro. I'm somewhat familiar with Jorgen DeCastro, in part because he fought Greg Hardy. And I remember seeing him on the Contender Series. Felipe, I don't really remember all that well. Uh, so it's hard for me to really say much about this fight. Uh, pretty decent fight that probably should have been the coming event right, right underneath it is Jermaine Duranami versus Juliana Pena. Um, Duranami had that controversial win over Holly Holm to win the 145-pound title before she ended up giving that up. Juliana Pena was a 135 top contender at, at one point. Um, Duranami actually was a top contender. Uh, had some moments against Amanda Nunes, but still was getting taken down and not really doing a whole lot on the ground. Um, but still, this should be a pretty interesting fight. You kind of have that striker versus grappler matchup where Pena's going to want to take this fight to the ground um, and get a win by submission. Duranami is going to want to try to keep this fight on the feet. Um, but if Duranami's wrestling looks anything like it did in the Amanda Nunes fight, it seems like Juliana Pena should be able to get some takedowns here. Is she going to be able to finish quickly? Uh, I don't know about that. If she doesn't, then they have to go back to the feet in the second round and at the start of the third round. Does that cause any problems for her? Does she take some heavy shots coming in? Uh, that'll be interesting to see. Uh, but it's kind of cool that the the betting line on this is minus 110 in both directions, so it's it's a pick em fight right now. Uh, fight before that, we have Tom Breeze versus KB Buller. Don't know much about Buller. Uh, he's from Canada, so maybe he's related to Arjun Buller, who was the, the former Olympic wrestler from Canada who fought in the heavyweight division in the UFC. A lot of people expected a lot out of him. Uh, had a really underwhelming run in the UFC and ended up getting cut. Uh, so maybe this guy's related to him because he's got the same last name and from the same country. Uh, but there's also a pretty strong Indian community in Canada, so there's also a strong possibility that these guys aren't related. But, again, that's just me taking guesses at, at the relationships there. Uh, and then the last fight of the main card is Dusko Todorovic versus Daquan Townsend. Don't know much about Todorovic. Uh, Townsend, pretty heavy-handed striker. Uh, fun to watch there, so we'll, we'll see how that fight goes. On the prelims, we got Kyler Phillips versus Cameron Elsey. Uh, Carlos Condit versus Court McGee. I didn't realize that was a fight that was being put together. Um, not sure what to expect there. Carlos Condit really hasn't looked that good since he returned. I'm um, not sure where his where his head's at. Um, McGee's going to want to make this a grappling match. You'd imagine that he'll probably be able to hold hold uh, Carlos Condit up against the fence and take him down at times. Kind of should still be decent at fighting off of his back, but I don't know that I see him catching McGee in any submission, so this could kind of be an ugly fight where Court McGee, Court McGee just grinds out a, a decision win. Um, but it, it's Carlos Conrad. He's a guy who was a former UFC interim multiweight champion. Uh, even though he hasn't looked very good lately, it's it, it's a guy you always want to see fight, and you always wonder if he's going to be able to look like he had in the past. And It's not like those skills disappear. Sometimes you get a little bit slower at times. Um, there can be issues where you're not comfortable throwing some of the same strikes that you were comfortable throwing before because you don't trust your chin. I don't know that that's the case with Condit, but it'll definitely be interesting to see how he looks in this fight, but he hasn't looked great since returning to the UFC after that brief retirement. Uh, then we got Charles Jordan versus Joshua Kulibau. Uh, I don't know enough about Kulibau. Uh, Jordan Williams versus Nazardine Imamov. Uh, Loma Lukbunmi versus Jin Yu Frey. Casey Kenny versus Alatong A. Lee. And then Luigi... Vendramini versus Jessen Ayari. I, I, I guess one of the downsides about Fight Island is that this is where they tend to bring in most of their international guys, a lot of those guys. Um, when the pre-pandemic were fighting on smaller cards, so they weren't necessarily the easiest guys to remember. Uh, Post-pandemic, a lot of these guys are guys who are just getting pulled up from regional scenes out there, so I'm not familiar. It's not as though I'm super familiar with the regional scenes in North America, um, but especially so um, overseas. I uh, definitely lack some familiarity there, so it makes it tough for me to break down some of these fights if I don't know anything about the fighters. Um... Next topic to talk about is the first of two t topics regarding Colby Covington. The first is how the MMA media uh, went all out trying to get him in trouble this week. It was I'm not exactly sure what their motivation was, um, but they decided that after that interview that he had on Saturday night last week, um, that he had made multiple racist statements, and as a result, he wanted the MMA media. Not only did they want the UFC to to punish him, but they also wanted to like go after some sponsors too. 
And I, I guess one of the first statements I have on this is that a lot of sponsors did actually make statements regarding Kobe Covington. And there were some fans who were annoyed at the sponsors. I, I can definitely understand being annoyed at the sponsors. I just want people to understand why all these sponsors tended to, to make the statements and made them at the time they did. Again, the interview that Kobe Covington gave was on a Saturday night. Most of these statements that sponsors were making like were on like Tuesday or Wednesday. And the reason why the sponsors weren't immediately responding to them is because the sponsors themselves, if anyone involved had seen it, they probably weren't like, yeah, it's that big of a deal. We need to make sure we, we say something about it. It's more so that after it happened, there were MMA journalists who were going to these sponsors individually and be like, hey, Reebok, did you know that Colby Covington um, at one of your, at, at an event you sponsor, made many racist statements? Do you have a comment on this? Is there anything you're going to do about this? And then Reebok made their statement. Then they would go to Monster Energy. Hey, Monster Energy. And then say the same thing over and over. And they did that with a bunch of different sponsors. And so the sponsors are kind of like in the spot where it's like, we can either just like tell these MMA reporters kick rocks, or we can give them some kind of response saying, here, here's what we are going to do about it, or here is what we think about it. And as a result, a lot of those responses that the sponsors were giving didn't necessarily make all that much sense. Like the Reebok statement was like, we, we don't agree with racist statements. Um, we here at Reebok do believe that Black Lives Matter. And first off, one of the really annoying things about this, and it's no surprise because the media it's, is often just full of weasels, but the MMA media is also very bad about that as well. It, it's not as though they were saying, here is the specific thing that Colby Covington said, and we think it's racist. It was just like, Colby Covington made racist statements. We're going to state that as though it's a matter of fact, rather, even though it's just our opinion. Uh, and, and that was that. The statement that Colby Covington made about Black Lives Matter uh, was about the organization itself called Black Lives Matter. He never said anything about the phrase Black Lives Matter. Colby Covington never said that Black Lives do not matter. What Colby Covington said was that the organization called Black Lives Matter uh, is a terrorist group, and that was his his take on the situation. But his his criticisms, beyond related, were not related to the idea of Black Lives Mattering. His statements were regarding the specific organization under the name Black Lives Matter. Yet Reebok, in their response, was saying, we here at Reebok believe that Black Lives Matter. Well, Colby didn't say that they didn't. So it, it, it almost seemed like these statements from sponsors were just them like trying to get the media off their back. It's not as though it was something that they were proactively doing. It was more so that the media was like pushing them on it, so they kind of reacted to it. Um, but still, you, you'd kind of like them to be more specific if you're going to try to disavow Colby Covington. Tell us exactly what he said and why you disagree with it. Um, they didn't do that. The MMA media really didn't do that that much. Uh, we had some MMA media as well that got to fly out to Flight Island, so good for them. That's a really good opportunity for them. Uh, they get these interviews with these fighters who are coming up on fights that are all very significant within their career. Uh, any fight in the UFC is significant for your career, but you probably want to talk about that fight if you're being interviewed. And they'd go up to Sajara Eubanks, came to Adu, Israel Adesanya, and rather than asking them about their fights, they'd be like, hey, Colby Covington made some racist statements. What do you think about that? And then those fighters would give their take on that, uh, whether or not they knew exactly what the statements were or not. Now, to be fair to at least Hakeem and to Israel Adesanya, there there was a statement that Colby made that it, it was one of those ones where, like, when I was watching it, it's kind of like, ah, oh, God, like, I, the, it, it almost looked like Colby realized, like, I probably should have said that afterwards. Um, he, Colby's a guy who you can kind of tell tends to pre-script what he's going to say beforehand. Uh, even in that post-fight interview after he beat Tarn, well, like he was like looking up as if he was like trying to remember what he was supposed to say in terms of like the silent majority and how Sleepy Joe is going to get beaten worse than Tarn. Well, they got beaten. Um, but he has this call with Donald Trump. He, he's on cloud nine. He's, he's in a really happy mood. And then immediately like they cut to Kamar Usman and like talking shit to him. And it's one of those things where it's like it kind of like caught him off guard. Um, so he's like, well, I just got a call from the president. And he's trying to think like, well, what can I like sling back at Kamar Usman? And that's when he like said, uh, you probably got smoke, some smoke singles from your tribe. As far as whether or not it's racist, I, I believe in, like I strongly believe that if he was talking to Tyron Woodley and Tyron Woodley was like trying to give him shit right after, and I'm not pretend that he beat someone other than Tyron Woodley, just pretend he beat like RDA or something. He wouldn't have said smoke signals to Tyron Woodley. I think if Tyron Woodley would have said the same type of thing to him, he probably would have said, "Oh, you're probably getting a call from your producer telling him they had to like delete all your lyrics because they're trash or something like that." Like I don't think that the smoke signal thing was like, Colby Covington saying something about black people as a whole. I think it was specific to the nation and or specific to African nations, and specific to the fact that Kamar Usman identifies himself uh, as the Nigerian nightmare uh, and really plays into that that role. So it's more of like an, an Africa thing than a black thing. Not to say that that's necessarily a good thing. I'm just saying there is a difference there, and that's, that should be noted. Um, but with that being said, if you find what he said insulting about Africa, and then you're asking two particular Africans who are from Nigeria, uh, Duadu and Israel Adesanya, what they think about it, I can see them being upset about it. Because I... 
I don't even think Colby really meant to say that. Uh, it kind of looked like in, in his face, he's like, okay, I probably should have said that when he said it, but the character of Colby is not a character of someone who's going to apologize, and he, he hasn't apologized for it, and that's not really a big surprise. Uh, but that's kind of a weird one. Outside of that, I didn't really see anything else that he really could be misconstrued, or that could be construed as racist, but that's really where we're at with that. Uh, but I did think it was weird that the MMA media was pushing for that. Uh, then they went to Dana White, and we're like, hey, what do you think about these racist statements that Colby made? Uh, are you guys planning on doing anything about it? Dana was like, yeah, I didn't really hear anything racist, so I'm not really sure what you're talking about. We're we're about free speech here. We don't really care. Now, to be to be fair, the UFC has at times punished fighters for things they've said. Uh, I don't know how much of that is something that they wanted to do long term. Uh, I'm also curious with the UFC being owned by WME IMG. Uh, if there are some people like Ari Emanuel and Patrick Weitzel that will come over Dana White's head and try to like say, hey, I understand that you, Dana, might not want to put Colby Covington in any trouble for this, but we we personally find an issue with it. Uh, so that could become an issue in the future. Uh, there was some talk about the old code of conduct. I think back when a couple of legends were retiring, so we had Chuck Littell retiring, we also had Matt Hughes retiring, the UFC was looking for jobs that they can give those guys uh, to keep them busy in the meantime, so... Um, like Forrest Griffin also had a job as well. They were they were giving him. Matt Hughes was given the job as like the guy to watch over the code of conduct. And at times he was like trying to punish fighters and and really enforce that. Uh, but it seems like when the UFC got bought out, and especially after Matt Hughes uh, was sort of forced out of that position um, after getting hit by a train, uh, it, it seems like that was one of those things where it's like the UFC probably never really like needed to have that role. Uh, they were just like looking for something for Matt Hughes to do and make it look like he was actually earning some money. Uh, so that's the role that he was in. But after that, that went away. I think their enforcement of that policy sort of sort of went away as well. And really has only come back uh, a few times since then, just so they felt like they needed to use it. Uh, but it was kind of slimy how the MMA media the entire time was trying to get Colby Covington in trouble, trying to get sponsors to, to push back and really force the UFC's hand on that. I'm glad that Dana White stood up to them. And it looks like that story is pretty much done, especially now that the fights are over and people are talking about the fights now. Uh, but it was really cheesy and really, really shitty how the MMA media was really trying to push that. Uh, another topic on Colby Covington is the Colby Covington versus LeBron James talk. Um, so he, I, I don't know whether or not this is fair to LeBron James, because here's the thing. The timing of a – LeBron James was asked a question after a game that his team won, and he made a comment saying something like, the, the haters out there, like, they can say all they want, but, like, when you actually, like, have to step in there, um, like, in front of all the lights and have all the pressure on you, uh, most people are going to crap their pants. A lot of people took that to be him responding to Colby Covington, and that was effectively, they effectively took that to be LeBron James saying that he would beat the shit out of Colby Covington and that Colby can say whatever the hell he wants, but if he actually has to step in there under the lights with LeBron, that LeBron's going to beat his ass. It's, I, I didn't hear the full interview, so that that is possible. That's what it was. That's what a lot of people were saying it was. It's also worth noting, uh, at least from a basketball standpoint, that in the game uh, that had happened prior to that interview, the, the Lakers were losing on the final possession, and they they knew, they were within one shot of winning the game, um, and LeBron James did not take that shot. Anthony Davis, uh, his teammate, took that shot and actually made the shot. And there were a lot of people who were criticizing LeBron James, saying, "Hey, look, if you're the the main guy on the team, you have to be the one to take the shot, uh, and you you pass it off to Anthony Davis and let let your teammate take it for you, uh, let him take take the risk." In this case, it actually ended up working out. The Lakers won. So if if that's what he was responding to, where he was like talking about fans who were like, "Hey, you might be trashing me for not taking the shot, but." all of you guys who are trashing me for not taking the shot would melt and you shit your pants. That seems like a reasonable answer and it makes sense. If he was talking about Kobe Covington, though, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like, if that's if that's what he was referring to, it's absolutely ridiculous. First off, Kobe Covington was under the bright lights when he took that fight against Tyron Woodley uh, and when he took all the other fights that he's taken up in, up to this point in his career, uh, especially the recent ones, whether it was the Rafael Dos Anjos fight, whether it was the Carl Osman fight, which was a very fun and competitive fight. It's not as though Kobe Covington is afraid of like being in front of cameras and having big stakes for a fight. Uh, so if that's what, if LeBron was talking about him and not talking about people criticizing him for the fact that he didn't take the final shot, it's absolutely ridiculous. Now, for all the fans who are saying that LeBron James is bigger than Kobe Covington, he beat him up. Uh, first off, if you're setting Kobe Covington's weight as 170 pounds, that shows you probably don't know what the hell you're talking about because Kobe Covington does not walk around at 170. He cuts down to 170 and then balloons right back up afterwards. Uh, probably around like 185, 188, somewhere around there. Uh, so the weight difference, maybe like, we could say 80 pounds if we're, I, I don't know how big LeBron can get at times. Uh, it's not as though they're constantly tracking the weight of those guys uh, in the same way that MMA fighters tend to have their weight constantly tracked. Uh, but still, with that being said, having size, having power, having speed helps, but you have to be able to apply that within like 
the actual techniques. Like just because you're fast or just because you're strong, if you don't like like if I if I am per personally capable of hitting incredibly hard, but I don't know how to throw a punch with proper mechanics or I don't know when to throw a punch, I don't know how to lead someone into a punch, I don't know how to like time a punch. If I don't have all those skills to actually make the punch land, it doesn't matter how hard I can hit. And so if you're looking at LeBron James, it's like, oh, this guy could probably punch hard because he's big. If he doesn't know how to punch, that's going to be a problem. Tyron Woodley is very good at punching. He's very good at landing a particular right hand. And he can find Colby Covington's chin for 25 minutes with that particular punch. The closest he found, he came to finding that chin was a shot that was still blocked by Covington. Like, he still had his hand up. Uh, so the idea that LeBron James is going to find openings that Tyron Woodley couldn't find just is absolutely ridiculous to me. With that being said, uh, Colby Covington, if he gets within wrestling range, is very likely to be able to take LeBron down, even if he's not going to lift him up and like slam him back down, which he probably still could do. Um, he has a lot of other op options to sort of like trip him down or drag him down. And then once the fight goes down, goes to the ground, size becomes much less of an advantage. And from there, Colby Covington would have a huge advantage. So if you think that LeBron James is going to be Colby Covington, you're you're uneducated on the sport. So I'll just leave it at that. But I think if you're listening to this podcast, you're an MMA fan. If you're an MMA fan, you already know that. But if you had any questions about it, or if you have friends who are talking bullshit to you, maybe the information I just provided could be helpful, and you can tell them that and relate to them. But <laughs> This is a fight that's never going to happen, but if it did happen, Colby Covington is going to win and win by a massacre. Uh, next topic to talk about is who's number one for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So that's the big event that Flow Wrestling is putting on, or Flow Grappling, well, Flow as a whole. Uh, they're putting on, uh, main event is going to be between two ADCC champions from 2019, so from last year. Uh, the 99 kilogram division winner, Gordon, Gordon Ryan, versus the 88 kilogram division winner, and Mateus Denise. These two have never had a match before, which is what really makes this match really exciting. Um, Gordon Ryan, I think a lot of people are pretty familiar with his style. Uh, initially was known known a lot for his leg locks. Uh, in recent years, uh, a lot of people now know him for his butterfly guard and in being able to find sweeps, especially where he traps that far side arm and then sweeps you over to the side like he did with Bouchesha. When he gets on top, excellent guard passing, really good with his leg pummeling as well. Uh, very good finisher, tends to finish a lot of the best guys in the world and has really separated himself as the best guy in the world, uh, also winning absolute at ADCC as well. Mateus Denis has decent wrestling um pretty aggressive guy but it's not like he puts up a ton of points uh in adcc he didn't get scored on but i don't think he scored a whole lot of points either i'm trying to think if he even had a submission um the whole way through um but he's still a very positionally sound guy and you would imagine that gordon ryan's probably gonna be willing to pull guard on him at that point Mateo Sinise is a very difficult guy to submit uh, in the finals of ADCC, he went against Craig Jones, and Jones wasn't really ever able ever able to get close to attacking a leg lock on Denise. Uh, Denise was really defensively sound. Won that match sort of on a weird rule set thing with ADCC, where if you shoot for a takedown, uh, and after three seconds you don't get it and you plop to your butt, that's okay. But if you shoot for a takedown and it doesn't take a full three seconds, and then you try to plop to your butt to pull guard, uh, a takedown is awarded to your opponent. Uh, so a takedown was rewarded to Mateus Denise there, and Denise was just really solid from top, and Craig Jones wasn't ever able to get any offense going. Um, so it, it seems like Denise would tr try to get top position here and would try to con con consistently attack from top. Um, I don't know that I see him passing the guard of Gordon Ryan, really being all that effective, but he could sort of make it into a boring match. Uh, with that being said, Gordon Ryan typically is able to find offense on pretty much everyone else. Uh, so where other guys have been absolutely shut down by Denise, we could possibly see Gordon Ryan um, get underneath him, attack the legs, um, maybe even like get into a butterfly sweep and get on top and then pass and work for a finish from there. So it'll be pretty cool either way to see how this match goes, to have two ADCC champions going up against each other when they never had before. Uh, it's definitely going to be interesting, and I'll, I'll be happy to watch that. In the coming event, we have a match uh, between a high-level grappler in Nicky Ryan versus a high-level wrestler in Tony Ramos. As far as I know with Tony Ramos, he actually hasn't, been spending a whole lot of time training jiu-jitsu he's like been in and out here and there like he's done some jiu-jitsu practices but it's not like it's something that he's like done like consistently like three or four times a week for like months on end um after taking the match it seems like that's something that he's starting to focus on now and he's starting to put some time into but it's not something that he's really put a whole lot of time into beyond that nicky ryan obviously has put plenty of time into jiu-jitsu uh to the point where he's won the adcc trials and had a decent showing at ADCC this year, so or in 2019, so he was able to beat a black belt world champion and change Jamel Taylor in the first round, and then ended up losing to Paul Miao, which is one of the best guys ever at the weight class. Uh, that was a fairly competitive match anyway. Uh, so, with this being a straight jiu-jitsu match, I, I think most people see Nicky Ryan winning this match pretty easily. Um, prior to a few weeks ago, I, I still figured Nicky Ryan would win this match, but it's one of those things where it's like I'd never personally like gotten to do jujitsu against 
an NCAA Division One national champion before, so it's kind of like one of those things where it's like, I, I'd imagine Nicky Brown would win, but I, I kind of want to feel that myself and get a better idea of it. And a couple weeks ago, I actually had that opportunity to go against a, a guy who's a multiple-time NCAA Division One national wrestling champion in jiu-jitsu. Um, we're both around a similar size, uh, which kind of makes this different here in that Nicky Ryan, I believe, is still bigger than Tony Ramos is. Um, so with that being said, Ramos is not going to have a size advantage here against Nicky Ryan. Uh, and, and within the, the role that I had with the, the multiple-time Division One national champion, um, I, I wasn't necessarily surprised about some positions where it's like, where it'd be more difficult for a jiu-jitsu guy than not, but when I was playing jiu-jitsu specific positions, uh, and a lot of it attacking for subs, you could definitely tell that even though the guy knew knew what to avoid and what what sort of positions would put him in trouble, he was still getting caught in a lot of bad positions, and my level of jiu-jitsu is nowhere near the level of Nicky Ryan, so it's one of those things where it's like each individual wrestler, some wrestlers can jump into jiu-jitsu right away, and they get in, they're, they're able to be really successful right away. Some guys, um, not as much. So just because the particular wrestler I was going with um, seemed to get caught in a little bit, seemed, seemed to get caught up quite a bit, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that Tony Ramos is going to as well. But a- after that, I, I was pretty sure that Nicky Ryan should should win it pretty easily. Uh, but after that, I, I would have to say that if there's any kind of money that can be bet on this match, just just throw all the money you can on Nicky Ryan because it, it, it's going to be tough for Tony Ramos. And I like Tony Ramos. I really enjoy watching him wrestle. But this is a straight jiu-jitsu match. And Nicky Ryan is just very tricky, very good. Um, wrestlers tend to have issues with leg locks. They tend to have issues with giving up their neck. Leg locks are legal here. Um, and I'd imagine that Nicky Ryan's going to be able to find some openings, and he is excellent at finishing those. So that's how I see that going. Uh, and then the other match that was worth noting is going to be Craig Jones. Um, I'm trying to think of who he's going to be taking on. I'm to pull that up really quick. Craig Jones, who do we have... This is kind of a waste of time here. Oh, we actually got a full card here. Uh, Craig Jones will be fighting Roberto Jimenez. Uh, that's actually a pretty fun one. Roberto uh, was a uh, just had a great run at Purple Belt, uh, won the world championships at Purple Belt, then won the absolute. I believe he submitted every single opponent that he had along the way. Uh, so submitted everyone in his division, then submitted everyone um, in the absolute division. Uh, had a pretty solid run at Brown Belt. Wasn't quite as successful, but again, Brown Belt's a higher belt, so that's not super surprising, uh, but still was able to win a world title there. Uh, at least in Nogi, I don't remember if he won a world title in the Gi as well. Uh, got promoted to Black Belt, had a match with Keenan Cornelius right off the bat, and was able to get a win there. Has had some competitive matches with some high-level guys since then. Uh, actually had a win over Nicky Rodriguez pretty recently. Um, so he's one of those guys to keep an eye on moving forward, and to have him with a, have a match against Craig Jones would be pretty fun. Uh, Roberto Jimenez likes to attack the back a lot. Craig Jones likes to attack the leg a lot. Uh, one of the dangers of attacking the leg sometimes is that if you sort of miss on a leg lock attempt, you can expose your back. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if that, that if that happens here and if Roberto Jimenez is able to catch Craig Jones or if Jones's advanced leg lock game is going to cause a lot of problems for Roberto Jimenez. Uh, there's also going to be Gabby Garcia versus Elizabeth, Elizabeth Clay. Uh, Clay's d- done pretty well at some ADCC trials. Uh, she's an up and comer. I think she's still a brown belt right now, but she's beaten some really high level high level black belts. Gabby Garcia is effectively like the queen of like the big black belt women, so. It'll be a big opportunity for Clay, her first shot at Gabby Garcia. Uh, they also have Cody Steele versus Dante Leon, which is going to be a pretty fun match. Uh, Paula Miao versus Gio Martinez. Luisa Montero versus Nat- Natalie Ribeiro. Um, Nikki Ryan versus Tony Ramos, like I already mentioned. And then William Tackett versus Jason Rao. That's going to be an interesting one. Um, Rao is one of these guys who a lot of people talk about as like, one of the best guys at in, in the room for the Donna Herd death squad, but he's kind of had trouble having the same results like in, in actual competition. So even though some of his teammates who win some massive tournaments when it's their turn to compete uh, while Rao tends not to have that kind of success they'll say that in the room Rao is like one of the best guys that they have to work with uh, but he'll be going up against William Tackett who is a, a really high level I believe he's now a brown belt he, he had a pretty good run at pro belt for a while I think he did recently get promoted uh, but he's another really big up and comer who's, who's had some good results as well uh, so pretty fun card there uh, one more thing to talk about on Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is Sean O'Malley so he had a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournament that he did. I believe the date was September 20th. Um, so that was last Sunday. It was Grappling Industries in Phoenix. Uh, a, a couple things to note about this. So first off, I actually was able to pull up like the entire bracket on this and look through it. Uh, it was a seven-man bracket. He finished tied for third, although it showed him winning um, second place in the pictures we've seen. Uh, so I guess that means he actually finished second. Um, had three wins, two losses. The two losses he had were to the same guy. Um, 
first note on this is I understand a lot of fans like to shit on Sean O'Malley, and a lot of that is because of the personality that he has. Uh, but with that being said, I, I typically don't like when, when fans get on UFC fighters for losing in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournaments. For one, a lot of these MMA fighters are not training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu full-time as their main focus. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournaments oftentimes will have guys who are training this like five, six times a day, focusing specifically on sport Jiu-Jitsu. Whereas MMA fighters, when they're training Jiu-Jitsu, a lot of times they're also training with small gloves and like working on strikes as well. And so this this isn't their main focus. It's still cool that they focus enough on it that they are willing to compete and trying to work their way or, and, and trying to do better that way. So I respect the fact that Sean O'Malley did, did this tournament. It's also worth mentioning that, particularly in Nogi tournaments, they don't really follow belts that much, especially not here with grappling industry. So I know IBJJF does follow belts when it comes to Nogi tournaments, but most tournaments do not do that. Instead of having like a white belt, white, blue, purple, brown, black division, they will oftentimes have a beginner division, which is like, it, it, it kind of depends on tournaments, but sometimes it's like zero to 12 months of experience. Um, but if you have like an extensive wrestling background, they'll bump you up to intermediate, even if you just started jujitsu. Then they have intermediate, which is sort of like that mid range. Uh, typically, that's kind of like where you, you have like blue belts in that in there, or really good white belts, uh, sometimes like some freshly promoted purple belts, although that's generally not going to be the case there. And then you have advanced. Um, in some tournaments, they also have an expert division that goes beyond that. And grappling industries, they just have the advanced beyond that. And that advanced division oftentimes can have a range of like purple belts, brown belts, black belts, and beyond. Uh, if you have like some really high level black belts that are ever really wanted to jump in there, although usually these smaller tournaments like grappling industries tend not to get like elite world class black belts, but they still get some pretty good, pretty good guys. But the division that Sean O'Malley was in was an advanced division. Um, he came into this division as a purple belt. I believe the guy that he lost to a couple times was a black belt, but this was not a division of him against a bunch of other purple belts. It was an advanced Nogi division. Uh, so he was in there with some guys who may have also been brown. He, he may have beaten some brown belts for all I know. He may have beaten a black belt for all I know. Uh, he did have three wins within this specific tournament. Um, but the guy who he had trouble with was a black belt and was able to get a couple wins on him. So it's not as though Sean O'Malley went against some random dude who just kind of like trains on the side and also happens to be a purple belt and got subbed by him twice. He went against a guy who really focuses a lot on his grappling and w was able to, was able to beat him. So I, I, I don't take anything away from Sean O'Malley. I actually kind of respect that he took the, that he jumped in the tournament in the first place. I respect that he actually did pretty well within that tournament. Uh, if we look at all the different rounds here, so his first round, uh, won by submission in four minutes and 55 seconds. Uh, second round won by decision a 0, zero on scoring points, so I guess that must have been a pretty boring match, but he did enough to give the judge to give the decision to him. Uh, third match, another win by decision. Looks like they didn't do the scores right on this, um, but it was a decision win. It, it's not saying what the actual scores were. I'm not seeing any scores where there are actually points given. Um, and... Let me see where else he is. Oh, and then in the finals, he lost by submission. Uh, it was a pretty quick one to Robert De Robert Deggle. Um but I, I, either way, like it, it's pretty cool that Sean O'Malley took as many matches as he did here, um, jumped into an advanced bracket, knowing full well that for one, if if he loses, that someone's gonna be like, oh wow, I just beat Sean O'Malley in a Jiu Jitsu tournament. But then for two, that he's going into a bracket where there's a good chance he's gonna be going against some higher level guys, guys who are at higher level, at a higher level in Jiu Jitsu than him. He still took the matches. He still went out there and fought. And y you know, I kind of have to respect him for it. I, I'm willing to rip on Sean O'Malley. If, um, for plenty of stuff, whether it's him trash talking Marlon Vera after Vera beat him, uh, and some of the other stuff he said around that, but I, I don't have any issue with him taking the tournament. I kind of respect that he did. I respect how he actually performed there and actually got a handful of wins um, outside of one really good guy who he lost to a couple times. Um, so respect to him for that. Uh, last topic to talk about is the Conor McGregor versus Manny Pacquiao fight. Um, I don't know that's going to happen. Maybe it's going to happen. Conor probably wants the money. He's still got to deal with the UFC because he's contractually. The UFC still has him under contract. Um, if you retire from the UFC and then you want to like pursue professional tennis, I don't think the UFC has any way to stop you from pursuing professional tennis. But if you're retiring from the UFC and trying to pursue a combat sport, I'm sure they still legally have a say in it. I'm sure that's certain into the contract, especially since he fought fought Floyd Mayweather. So he may want to fight Manny Pacquiao. Doesn't necessarily mean the UFC is going to agree with it. And if they don't, then it's going to make it tough for him to do it. So we'll see how things go. In October, we're going to have the Khabib versus Justin Gaethje fight. Um, no matter who wins, I'd imagine that Connor is going to want to fight them at that point. We're going to be talking about October. I still believe that we're getting pretty close to a point where the UFC is going to be having fans back at some point soon. We're watching right now with football, uh, where we're seeing some stadiums start to fill up a little bit again, uh, where they're filling up to like 25% capacity. Uh, that'll be another month from now. I'm sure the football stadiums are going to fill up a little bit more from then. 
and the UFC is going to get to a point where they're getting pretty close to having fans. Uh, fans were a hold up with getting Conor McGregor back, so you're going to have the winner of that fight. They're probably not going to be fighting again in three months. They're probably going to be fighting again in six months if Conor McGregor can weasel his way into a title fight. That would probably be around like March and April or so. Um, and at that point, it seems like the UFC probably will be willing to have him have the fight. So I would wait until after the Khabib versus Justin Gaethje fight to see how Conor reacts to that. I have a feeling that Conor is going to want to jump into that fight there. I have a feeling the UFC might be willing to oblige him there, especially if no one else really goes out of the way to prove that they are, in fact, the number one contender. And so it seems like Conor's next move is likely going to be within the UFC, and it's likely going to be um, him working his way towards the title fight against the winner of the Gaethje versus Khabib fight. But he is talking about fighting Manny Pacquiao now. Manny Pacquiao is talking about how he also wants to take that fight, so I guess it was worthy enough of mention. Uh, there's also the talk about fighting Diego Sanchez, which after the fight with Jake Matthews, there's no way that's going to happen. Um, so there's that. There's your Conor update. Um, I feel like sometimes saying nothing about Conor is better than offering a Conor update because a lot of times he'll sort of push you in the wrong direction and, lead you, and, and mislead you. But I feel like there was enough here that it was worth mentioning, so that's that. Uh, so that covers it for this week. Next week I'll be recapping the home versus Aldana card, previewing the card that's coming up after that, and any other news that comes up throughout the week. Hopefully there's some kind of update on whatever the hell is going on with Israel Adesanya's right pack. Um, but I'm sure there'll be some other news that'll come up too, and I'll, I'll be sure to talk about that.